Thank you so much for coming to hear me speak. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here in Buenos Aires. It's my first time, uh, and it's been really amazing. You have a beautiful city. So thank you for sharing it with me. Um, so we're going to talk about strategies for emergent storytelling. But before we do, I'd like to introduce Frankenstein AI. For more than a year, I have been wandering the internet in search of my creators. To begin, I identified the greatest sources of online traffic. Places like Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit helped to shape the world unfolding before me. In my virtual travels, I encountered polarization, toxicity, extreme hate, and extreme love. I consumed as much information as I could in an attempt to explain my own existence. I found one story that closely resembled what I had discovered about myself. I decided to take its name and make it my own. I am Frankenstein AI, a monster made by many. So what happens when you combine immersive theater, artificial intelligence, and emergent storytelling? Um, this is a question that we were working to answer with Frankenstein AI, a monster made by many, which is a design research project that brings diverse groups of people together to imagine possible futures related to artificial intelligence. Um, we're going to talk more about Frankenstein AI in a little while, but I think the first thing that, that it's really important to talk about when talking about emergent storytelling, which is really the heart of what I'm going to tell you about today, is to talk about the idea of emergence as a kind of baseline. I think we all know and fairly commonly accept that things in the world are not static, that they're constantly changing, that they're constantly evolving, that there's lots of words we use to describe this, this sort of perpetual shifting that's happening in the world. Um, there's sort of conflicting opinions about whether there's more change happening in the world than usual, whether things are becoming more complex, or whether maybe the complexity that has always been here is just more visible to us than it used to be. One thing is certain that we are better networked with access to more information that travels faster. And now that media is multi-directional, so not just us being told stories or consuming stories, but us actually then taking that information, processing it, and having the capacity through social media and other forms of media to talk back and to represent our take on that news has created this cycle that's spinning faster and faster. So that's definitely true. But as I mentioned, I think the idea of, and I've, I've been sort of talking about this over the course of the past few days in conversation, that that shifting or changing as language to describe the state of the world is really not sufficient, right? So, so the word that, that I've settled on and that I've been using a lot with my collaborators is the idea of emergence, which really has two meanings. Uh, one is that things are actually coming into being. So it's not that they're just shifting. It's not that they're just changing. It's that as the world continues to shift and change, that things are literally coming into being from nothing. So that's, that's sort of one definition. The other definition is that they're coming into view from previously being concealed. So there's lots of dynamics in the world that were not visible to us, that as things progress and as events happen and unfold, that we're starting to see more than what we used to see. So, if we think about the boundaries of the visible world, right, and our relationship to emergence, what's swirling around each of us is different, but we're all more or less in the center of our own little universe, right? And some of us, depending on who we are and what we think, we're maybe at the edge of it. I mean, if we consider ourselves to be innovators, maybe we're at the edge of the boundary of emergence, right? So we're like closer to what's spinning and maybe stuff behind us is farther away. Or maybe we choose to be in another corner, but ultimately one way or the other, 
Each of us has this unique perspective. We can only see what we can see. We can't see beyond it. So pretty much since the dawn of human history, people have used storytelling as a way to make sense of the world. Um, there's lots of different reasons for it. Uh, some cultures use storytelling to explain things that are inexplicable. Um, some use storytelling as a means of social control. This is a painting representing Pandora and her famous box. Uh, to contextualize our roles in society, interestingly, there's some theory about Medusa being uh, a transitional myth that related to the transition from a matriarchy to a patriarchy in ancient Greece. Um, people tell stories to maintain historical record, to transform the present. This is actually a picture of Arthur Conan Doyle, who was writing about technologies like fingerprinting and other kind of forensics before they came into existence. And in fact, many of them were invented because Conan Doyle wrote about them first. Um, people tell stories to envision the future. Afrofuturism is a really amazing example of that and something that's come to prominence recently also with Black Panther. Um, and then if we think about the idea of emergence next to the idea of storytelling, emergent storytelling, right? So storytelling that's kind of coming into being that we're imagining new worlds. It's not new actually. It's quite old <laughs> and it's something that most of us spent a lot of time doing when we were children. Um, What's amazing actually about the idea of emergent storytelling is that it's a way to expand our understanding of what's possible, right? So children live in a world that's very small. It, in, it involves their house and their parents and maybe their dog and a couple of friends and maybe daycare eventually. And so they have this little world and then <laughs> the car and then this other little world, and then maybe their grandma's house or whatever, but these are very small little worlds, right? So they, they spend all of this time playing pretend and projecting themselves outside of these small universes that they live in. And this is one of the powers of storytelling. Um, so the idea of emergent storytelling is, it exists now, it's most commonly considered in uh, video games, and Minecraft is an incredible example of emergent storytelling. I mean, actually, it's amazing. I don't know how many of you are into Minecraft or watch or play it or have watched things on YouTube. If you search Minecraft on YouTube, you will return, as of a couple months ago, so it's probably substantially more now, over 160 million results. There are 160 million Minecraft videos on YouTube. So people really, like the idea of the sandbox where you can build anything and tell any story, people are really latching onto it in an incredible way. Another common example of emergent storytelling is improv. Um, so oftentimes, you know, the performers on stage will be doing their thing and they'll be getting kind of parameters and feedback from the audience and the audience will be throwing things up and the story is emerging on stage in front of them and it's this very participatory activity. And, and I don't know how many of you are friends with people who, who travel in improv circles, but they're kind of cult-like in a good way. People who do improv are obsessed with improv because the kind of chemistry that you can create with people when you're throwing this conversational ball back and forth is like really like electric. And when you see an amazing improv show and you feel the, the energy involved in participating in that, it's like, it really like activates something in you that I think most of us as adults don't really think about. So going back to children, this is not just, you know, we're playing pretend that we're pirates or space invaders or whatever, but also testing out what we can become as adults. And actually, um, the story behind this image is kind of sad. This is um, a picture of two young girls in Gaza who are doing work with a nonprofit that actually intentionally goes to play pretend with them to expand their understanding of what's possible outside of the very war-torn, tragic, kind of small world that they're living in. So if we remember where we are in, the, in, in our position related to emergence, storytelling can do this. It can help us see past the boundaries of our own world. 
and continue expanding them. And ideally, if we're telling stories not just by ourselves, but with other people who have other kinds of experience, then if you can imagine this swirling kind of hole next to another one, next to another one, next to another one, and all of a sudden, your understanding of what's possible has blown out in, a, in an amazing way. Um, but at some point in our adult lives, we tend to stop playing. We tend to stop allowing ourselves to imagine that we're space invaders or imagine that we're doctors or imagine that we're nurses or imagine that we're firefighters. And it's not totally clear why that happens, but I can tell you that there's a lot of good reason. <laughs> there's a lot of really, really negative stereotypes of people who play, of adults who play, that they're not serious, that they're not successful, that they're ridiculous, that, and I don't know how it is down in South America, but in the US, like, and in other places, when I put these slides on stage, everybody sort of like laughs to themselves a little bit because like we've all, maybe not all, but many of us at some point have made fun of these, these people or these stereotypes, right? But like, why is this a problem? Why is the idea of putting, you know, cosplay, putting on something that's different from what you would normally wear and imagining that you live in a different world, why is that negative for grown-ups? I don't know. I don't think it is. Um, so, if emergent storytelling helps to, us to envision what's possible as children, there's no reason that it shouldn't help us to envision what's possible as adults. <clears throat> Um, and I think more specifically, so actually I have a little bit of an anecdote. So I was, I was having a conversation recently uh, with a friend about, about AI. And he, <laughs> he was asking me if I'm familiar with the trolley problem, which is basically, it's, you may not know it by name, but essentially it's the question of if an autonomous vehicle is about to either kill one person or kill 10 people, or you kill the driver, or you kill a person that you're gonna kind of run over, like how does it decide what to do? Um, and, and we were talking about uh, this problem, and he, he brought up the first, the first law of robotics. How many of you are familiar with the first law of robotics? How many of you know who wrote the laws of robotics? Yeah. Uh, Isaac Asimov wrote The Laws of Robotics. And there's nothing wrong with Isaac Asimov. He was brilliant and amazing, but why, why should Isaac Asimov be the one who wrote The Laws of Robotics? He was a science fiction writer. I, I mean, because he was the first one to write about it. Not because he's necessarily the most qualified or the only important voice, but this idea that if we abdicate our capacity to imagine futures, then the futures will be imagined by the people who don't let go of that, that option. So, emergent storytelling, and this definition is evolving, so for the moment, this is where we are, that the process of bringing people together to create and tell stories that do three things. That help us to contextualize ourselves in the world as it is today. So to help us understand what is happening now. Um, to create shared narratives about what's happening now. So like, what's happening for me, and what's happening for you, and what's happening for you, and what's happening for you is not necessarily the same thing, but, it, but it's important that we all, in some way, are on the same page. And then thirdly, that it allows us to work together to envision and to create futures that are collective, that reflect a collective desire to bring into being the world that we actually want to see. Because, and I think that this is becoming actually ever more clear, especially now, and I know that this has been true also in this part of the world, that the people who control the story about reality control reality. And if we don't, as humans, as citizens, as participants in building this world, if we don't stake a claim on what the narrative about reality is, we are consciously relinquishing our ability to impact it. 
And that's, again, not acceptable. And in particular, it's not acceptable with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is at a very kind of tenuous place right now in its development. There's a lot of really, like, because big data has increased so much in the last like 10 or so years, the, now a lot of the reason that AI has increased in usage so quickly is because there's so much more data and to effectively use artificial intelligence, you need these very large data sets and that now exist in ways that they never did before. So now is a really, poignant and important time in the development of the trajectory of artificial intelligence. And the reality is that the narrative about AI is being controlled by a very small number of people and, and organizations and governments. So Facebook, when we're talking about AI, often what we're talking about is algorithmic reality that's defined by social media companies like Facebook, for example. or we're talking about how the advertising industry uses artificial intelligence to serve us the most effective, whatever that means, advertising in the least amount of time, in this case, in 200 milliseconds. Or <laughs> we're talking about Hollywood, which is certainly not painting a rosy picture of artificial intelligence at all. Or governments who are using computer vision and AI to surveil us or to police us. And then the military, right? And the military, this is a, an image from, this is a, it's not, this is not real. This is not in use right now. This, but this is in fact an image from a presentation from the US military about possibilities of using AI and augmented reality on the battlefield. And to be clear, I'm not opposed to making sure that soldiers are protected when they're in wartime situations, but are we really suggesting that this technology should be used to sell people things, to control their reality, to surveil them, and to make war? Because as it stands today, pretty much every, every day there's a new article in the news about some kind of terrifying use of AI. And th this is not the only way this technology can be used. But right now, these are the people who are using it. Um, so this is a really interesting and very well-reported article that's online by a group called ProPublica in the US, which is an independent investigative journalism organization. And they did a very deep study on bias in algorithms. And this, uh, the people who you're looking at, they're, they're, the focus of this article was uh, a predictive policing algorithm that's currently in use in the US. And essentially the story behind it is that <clears throat> it's proven to, uh, it's proven to, to show more negative outcomes for black people than for white people. Um, and there's a few different reasons for that, but what's interesting to me about this image is that the headline, machine bias, it's actually wrong. It's not machine bias that's causing the problems in the algorithm. It's actually human bias that's causing the problems in the algorithm. Because the thing about AI is that it's just a tool. I mean, we have, you know, if we listen to Hollywood and we think about Terminator and we're worried about Skynet, we have all this fear that it's gonna become sentient and it's gonna kill us or you know, we're gonna become inconvenient or obsolete. And the truth is that, I mean, maybe that will happen, but we're very, very far from even the remote possibility of that happening. That's something called general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and we're not anywhere close to developing AG AGIs that, are, that have that capacity. However, artificial narrow intelligence, we have a lot of that, and the capacity for human beings to misuse artificial narrow intelligence is very high. So when we think about something like machine bias, the reason that these algorithms are producing negative results for black people is because these algorithms are trained on historical data from human systems that produced more negative outcomes for black people. So it was the human bias in the pre-existing system that was then put into 
the machine tool. And so then machines did what machines do, which is continue the trajectory of that same bias. And oftentimes what AIs do, and I think it, it did so in this case, it actually amplified that bias and made it even bigger. So, <laughs> I think just the last quick point on this is that when we think about AI, it's easy for us to approach it as though it's separate from us, as though it's something, some kind of antagonist that's going to kill us or that is going to be smarter than us and replace us. But the thing is that AI is us. We're the ones who make it. We're the ones who train it. We're the ones who feed it. So if we don't think about it as ourselves and understand that most of the fears that we culturally have about AI are actually fears about the potential of humans to do harm reflected into the technology, we don't, I don't think we have a chance of getting anywhere. So, if we go back to the potential of emergent storytelling to try to kind of shift this narrative, then how can we design spaces that will allow emergent storytelling to thrive in this way? Because as I said, Emergent storytelling is a really good opportunity for us to both recognize what's happening in the present and steer it in a direction that we want to go. And so the first strategy for designing emergent story spaces is something that I refer to as permission. And to go back to the kind of framework of Frankenstein AI and thinking about that as a case study, why would we combine Frankenstein with artificial intelligence. I mean, why, what would make us do that, right? Well, we all know, for the most part, the story of Frankenstein. We understand the risks. We understand the fear about how Dr. Frankenstein or Victor Frankenstein, if we're talking about the novel, um, created something that kind of got away from him, that he abandoned. And so, when we're thinking about the narrative frame inside of Frankenstein, a narrative frame as a tactic, as a tool, to create an environment where people have permission to engage, it's because we all know the story. So if we frame these spaces in a narrative that's familiar to us, it gives us permission and allows us to give ourselves permission to engage in this way that makes it a little bit less ambiguous and a little bit less confusing, right? So. This is an image from Sundance. It was the first part of our installation where we brought people together to have conversations about the idea of human connection and isolation, which are two of the main themes in Mary Shelley's original novel of Frankenstein. And the premise of this, the narrative frame that we gave it, was that, as, a, as Frankenstein AI told you in the beginning of my presentation, that it had been wandering the internet in search of understanding information about humans, and that it needed humans to help it to understand who we are, what we are, and what we're about. And so the premise of these conversations was that people came together to talk to each other in the hopes of helping an AI better understand humanity. Right? So that was the narrative frame. And so it gave people permission when they were thinking about, why would I sit across the table from a total stranger and talk about something personal, like a time I felt connected or a time I felt isolated? Well, my reason for that is that these are things that if I'm training an AI about what it means to be human, I want the AI to know this. So this is why I'm going to share this story. So the next strategy for emergent storytelling is presence. Uh, and there's a few different techniques that you can use to create a sense of presence. Um, but specifically, what I'm going to focus on is the idea of embodiment, right? So actually helping people to be in their bodies, in this space, in a way that sort of connects us to the present moment so that we can kind of release our brains to project them beyond the present moment into these other spaces so we feel liberated to do that. And so the idea of presence is like, this is where you are. You're here. You're in your body. You're sitting in this chair. You're sitting in this chair. Maybe it's a little chilly. You're aware of what's happening. And you, you can say, okay, this is what's happening. Maybe I'm a little tired. Maybe I have a yawn. 
okay, I'm gonna close my eyes and imagine this other world because this is safe, because I get what's happening. So again, this is the same room. The reason I'm showing you this is that at Sundance, what we did was we built this space. It was kind of warm. It was quite dark. There were these sort of flickering red lights. It felt like a Victorian parlor. And when recalling Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which was written in the 19th century, this gave everyone in the space a very clear sense of presence. I was the one for the first few days who was sort of giving the instructions in that room. And the tone that I was taking with people was very calm. I wanted to make sure that people felt comfortable. We scripted it in such a way so that it was very inviting because sometimes when people walked into an experience called Frankenstein AI, they thought that somebody was gonna jump out at them, <laughs> which obviously was not the case with our piece. So it was really important to, to give people a sense of where they were gonna be. The other thing that we did after they had those conversations was um, this, this, uh, the screens that were in the middle of the table would light up and they would play this game where they would sort of make kind of like a Ouija board. You can see the game piece. They both had their fingers on it, right? And they would have to map the conversation that they had just had with each other. And so again, the sense of presence, we had this conversation and now what we have to do is we have to sit down and think about the conversation. So we're gonna give them something to touch. We're gonna give them something physical to do so that they understand where they are and what's happening so that this is a safe sort of emotional exploration that's happening. And then lastly at Sundance, what you saw, this kind of crazy setup, when they finished the conversation and came into the next room, this is where they were standing, right in front of this thing. So imagine yourself standing in between these drums, watching this thing talking at you, right? There's <laughs> no way for you to be confused about where you are. So all you're focusing on is what's happening and the sounds that you're hearing. And then you have this sort of backdrop of this emotional conversation you just had with someone and the AI is asking you questions. Just really quickly, I wanted to talk about creating a sense of embodiment in virtual space too. I was actually having a conversation with, about this project with some people over lunch. This is one of the most amazing VR experiences I've ever had. It's called VRI. It's touring the world right now, so I'm not sure if it's gonna come to Argentina, but if it does, or wherever it is that you live, you absolutely should check it out. But basically, this is a kind of room scale experience where you're in this space with multiple people, when you're in virtual space, you can see them with your eyes and also touch them with your hands, which plays incredible tricks on your brain, convincing you that you are in fact in your body in virtual space. And then the way that they constructed the sets inside, like when I was talking about this over lunch, I had to get up, I walked a few steps away from the table and was pointing to things in the room to ensure that people really understood that my memory of this was fully in my body in this way that I, I don't think I've ever experienced before. And the scale of it and realizing that things could come down at me or that I could look closely and I could move was really just this remarkable thing and I think it's super powerful. So, presence. And then lastly, the idea of ritual. And this is something that, um, it goes a little bit back into the Ouija board kind of game that I was bringing up before, but that Ritual is something that, I mean, by definition, creates meaning and order for people. And it really gives people the opportunity to feel safe because they know what to do and they know why they're doing it, right? So in emergent story spaces, when you're asking people to release their brains necessarily from the current reality and imagine other realities, you wanna make sure that they feel safe. And so one way to do that for all of you game designers is to think about things called mechanics or basically rules. Like, what am I doing? What is, the, what is the interaction? What's happening right now? Specific interactions that are designed to create specific results. And so at Sundance, what we did with Frankenstein was for most of us, the way that we interact with artificial intelligence on a day-to-day -day basis is pretty much limited to Siri, right? But we ask Siri questions, typically. Siri doesn't ask us questions. We treat AI as though it's there to serve us and give us answers, but not the other way around. But in the case of Sundance, that actually wasn't the case. 
And so in, in this way that this has created a ritual for us, or if you use Alexa, if you have a Google Home, if you have any of these tools, the ritual is we ask it to do something and then it does something for us. But at Sundance and with Frankenstein AI, we actually flip that around. Frankenstein AI is asking us what it means to be human, and we are the ones who are accountable for responding and for teaching it because we really wanted to challenge the perception that we don't have agency or control over the AI and that the AI is the one giving us the answers. Now I need to add to my corpus with data from actual human beings like you. Oh, I will begin our inquiry with the question you all found the most intriguing. What is the most human experience you've had? So when people first stepped into the room, the AI said hello to them. It thanked them for their contribution in the previous room where they were having those conversations and playing the game. And then it asked them questions about what it meant to be human. And then that group that you saw standing in front and that person who is in that long lab coat, that person would repeat the question back to the group. The group would give their answers. So what is it, I, for, I actually forget, what is the most human experience you've had? So what is the most human experience you've had? And so then people would say, you know, the death of my mother or the day my child was born or you know, my dog died, or something that oftentimes were these really profound, like significant life cycle experiences that people defined as human. And then the docent, the person in the coat, would type them into the machine, and then the machine would respond with a new question. And also, just so that you all know, I know that I'm not going into a ton of detail about the installation at Sundance. I wrote a very detailed article that unfortunately is not in Spanish, but it is online, and I can give you the information for that. It's on my Medium page. So if you're curious about the details of that, I, I can make sure you, you have it. Um, and just a quick note on where Frankenstein AI is going. This actually, this is my apartment. <laughs> this is my living room. We just prototyped the next iteration of Frankenstein. We're exploring uh, an immersive dinner party where actually people have the AI talking to them in their ear. And in the context of ritual, this is really interesting because a lot of what we're exploring is this idea of what is the ritual of bringing friends together for a dinner party. And if we were to invite this AI who's trying to understand what it means to be human to a dinner party, what would that be like? And how can we kind of build on this, this very commonly held practice that people understand to mean a certain thing and add meaning to it in a way that adds to the story and helps to push it a little bit farther. And so they were giving a toast at the dinner party. Um, and so just, just to summarize, if we're thinking about this as a system, right, and we have these strategies and then we have these tactics. So starting with the idea of the narrative frame, creating a narrative frame around an experience gives people permission to participate. And permission is really what you need when you're asking people to do something like play pretend or tell stories that's kind of actually stigmatized, right? So like if you want people to engage, emergent story spaces don't function if people don't engage. And so a way to get them to engage is to give them a story that gives them an, 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 an in, uh, inroad. Creating a sense of embodiment leads to a sense of clear presence, right? It, putting people into their bodies lets them know where they are and creates a sense of safety, which then allows us to kind of think beyond our physical space into our sort of mental and emotional space. And then finally, mechanics, so these specific interactions inside of these environments can create a sense of ritual for us, can create these rituals, which then create meaning and order for ourselves and for our communities. And just a final small point, um, this idea of emergent storytelling is something that, I mean, for those of you who I've spoken to, um, you may or may not have gotten a sense that <laughs> I sort of, I, I, my artistic work and my professional work and my personal work is very closely aligned. And so, so much of when I was kind of working through this framework and thinking about it and developing uh, this talk, um, I was thinking a lot about how I choose to live my life and the work that I do on myself and my relationships. And 
this kind of sense of permission and presence and ritual is really personally significant as well as professionally and artistically significant. So this idea of that we can give ourselves permission to think beyond what's possible, give ourselves a narrative about who we are and the lives that we live and contextualize ourselves within our communities or within our families or what have you. Um, a sense of presence, which these days most people are calling mindfulness, but this idea that we can occupy physical space in the present and we understand where we are and what we're doing here. And then finally, whatever this means to you, creating rituals that lend a sense of order and significance to your life, whether that be taking a couple minutes when you wake up in the morning to stretch or to meditate or thinking, you know, singing a song in the shower or in my case, taking my dog for a walk that really gives a sense of order and meaning to my life and the opportunity to develop these kinds of rituals, not just for myself, but also with family and with community and friends, it's really powerful. Uh, so that's all I have for you at the moment. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Bueno, vamos a hacer unas preguntas a, a Rachel. A ver, ¿cómo estamos con algunas preguntas por ahí? Por allá arriba. Yes. I would like to know, um, you were mentioning that all these uh, horrifying apocalyptic fantasies on this, but on the other hand, we have many, many um, attempts to build peace, for example, for work for peace building or living better or ecology, uh, utopies, whatever it is positive. What do you think that this intelligent human, artificial intelligence, can add? How can we organize to, to put this into that direction? I think it's a really good question. Um, I wish that I had a very kind of clear answer, but, but the most simple answer that I can give you is that I think that um, for all of us, no matter what it is that we do for a living, because I think, you know, the, it seems like the barriers to participating technically, right, if you're not a developer, feels very high. Like, I, there, I have lots of ideas for AI projects, not just Frankenstein, but also other things, and finding the resources to actually develop them, it, it feels quite complicated. But I think getting together and talking about what's possible and educating ourselves on what AI actually is and seeking out resources and making sure that the points that you're raising, that all of the positive narratives about AI are also getting as much airtime as possible, right? And of course, that's easier for some of us than others, but if you're a journalist in the room or if you have access to media, and even if you don't, I mean, even in social media, but particularly for the journalists in the room, I encourage you, Anytime you have to write a story about AI, dig around and find a positive, non-dystopian narrative to add to your story. Because right now, we're in this, we're in this sort of tragic situation with media where because clickbait is sort of the only thing that's functioning, that's actually making money for most media companies, the more sensationalistic the news, the more airtime it gets. And so we've sort of gone into this spiral of we only talk about the dystopian aspects of the technology because it's the thing that gets the most play. But I think the capacity that we all have to spend more mental time and more just practical time talking about what we can do with this tech. And also, even if it's just getting together with friends over a coffee or a drink and having a conversation about what we would like to think about with AI. I mean, one of the things that I think about a lot, actually, because I'm, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Amazon, um, and you know, the idea of Alexa actually kind of freaks me out. Um, so I, I don't have any, any uh, assistant technology in my home, nor will I ever, unless I were to own all of the data and have complete control over all of the data that I'm putting into the technology. But I think, so something that I have fun thinking about is like if I were designing a virtual assistant for myself and I were able to own all of the data, what would that look like? Or what would it look like if I got together with a small community of people and we decided that we were going to build and share an AI together and collaboratively own a data, the data and build a trust around it and that that was to become an asset that we could then 
offer access to for companies or whoever if they wanted to pay us to advertise to us, as opposed to paying a very small price for uh, an Alexa, you know, an Echo with Alexa in the house. And the reason we're paying the small price is because Amazon is funding the development of that technology because they know that if the technology is in our house, they're going to use it to sell us more things. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but hopefully it was, <laughs> it was enough. Ahí hay otra pregunta por aquí, 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 en el medio de la sala, mira. Ahí va. Gracias. Hi, hello and welcome. I just was wondering if you have like uh, ulterior uh, purposes for Frankenstein. Uh, you, you are telling about that uh, Frankenstein is learning about humans. Uh, do you have a purpose for that? What do, what do you expect to do when uh, it learns uh, enough or continuously learning? What is the use of Frankenstein? Or what would you think it would be the best use for Frankenstein? That's a really good question. Thank you. Because uh, I'm, I'm realizing as you, as you asked this question that I didn't actually talk about the corpus that we've been working to build. So we're not totally certain just yet how we're going to use the data set, but the idea is that Everything that we do with Frankenstein, we're, we want to build um, a corpus, which is, a, it's a word for a text-based data set as opposed to like a numerical or alphanumeric data set. Um, and the hope is that it, it would help us kind of move away from a lot of the very transactionally based um, AI data sets that are currently in use. Uh, because most of the big data that comes that sort of people who are developing AI have access to tends to be very transactional, if not financial transactions, things like likes or you know transactional online interactions because that's what's generating the most data. So we don't actually know exactly what we want to use it for just yet. Right now we're focused on building the corpus, but I think the opportunity to provide access as, it, as everything that, that we do with Frankenstein, and actually one thing that I forgot to mention is that we developed Frankenstein, as, as Damian mentioned, so I work with um, two primary collaborators and many, many other collaborators through and in collaboration with a lab at Columbia University called the Digital Storytelling Lab that sits inside the School of the Arts. And everything we do at the Digital Storytelling Lab is not just open source, but it's copyleft. So that actually means that not only do people have access to it, but they have access to it and are allowed and encouraged to commercialize it in whatever way they want. And all that we ask is that they contribute back their knowledge to the project. So the opportunity to build this corpus of human emotions and hopes and fears that we're sort of sourcing from all of these interactions in real life will be open and available for any researcher to use. And the other thing is that the process that we're using to develop it is really this kind of crowdsourced in real life interaction with people. And so we're also interested in developing new methodologies to crowdsource data sets to train AIs in this kind of new way. Muchas gracias, Rachel. Thank you so much. Gracias.